Oi oi, it's your boy Jack Slack. This is the Jack Slack podcast. We're coming at you on Monday the 18th, or at least I'm recording on Monday the 18th. I might have to edit this tomorrow morning. Doing it late. If you know what's going on, lockdown life is meaning that I have to record my podcast in the evenings now. Um, but I got an article up earlier today on the Max Holloway beatdown. My work rate today has been Holloway-esque. Did article, published article, put up audio for article, deadlifted, went for a walk, doing podcasts now, not doing badly. But if you're here, you're likely uh, wanting to hear about Max Holloway putting the the beating of a lifetime, probably the worst beating in UFC history on a man. You know, maybe you got some Cain Velasquez ones that were also one-way traffic, but statistically, <laughs> this, is, this is easily the biggest beatdown in UFC history. Um, maybe if he just started taking him down and slamming him, like, to, to run his stats up, just for that, for the, for the sake of that. But, um, yeah, honestly, astonishing. Um, I don't know what to make of it. I need Max Holloway to test positive for EPO, otherwise my worldview is just completely out of whack now. Like, how? The, the numbers do not even make sense. Uh, you know, you were watching it, and I, I, you know, I trust the numbers, but the stats had him putting out 750 strikes over 25 minutes. 60 times 25, 1,500. So there are 1,500 seconds in the fight, and he threw 750 strikes. Basically, well, no, almost exactly a strike every two seconds. That's almost impossible. Well, I mean, that's impossible for almost everyone on the roster. You know, these guys are training for five rounders and they're still not putting out anywhere close to those numbers. He overtook his own strikes thrown. Oh, no, I think the strikes landed by like 100 strikes. He landed 400 and something. But, you know, he was working at over a 50% uh, connect percentage plus throwing 700 strikes. Just astonishing. Um and there's no one else who could do that. You know, you could you could accuse Calvin Cater of becoming a punching bag, and he did a little bit even in the first couple of... No, not, not so much a punching bag, but he sort of shelled up and let uh, Zabit go to work on him. But Zabit worked at 100 miles an hour, still didn't put, have the same level of output as Holloway, and then gassed himself out. Or to give you a more uh, recent comparison, the women's, car, the women's fight on the, on the prelims, and the prelims for this one were as bad as the main card was good. The, the divide between them was incredible. Um, but, you know, looking down the card, you were going, why are these people here? And it wasn't like people you hadn't heard of. It was people like the two girls, what was their name? Mello and Morass. And they, like, Morass was on a 1-4 and four run. Mello was on a th an 0-3 oh run. You know, they were provably not good. <laughs> They're still just put on this card. And then they had a fight that was shit. But in that fight... Sarah Morass decided that she was going to throw all her punches as key eyes and not actually worry about getting into range to connect. And even not worrying about getting into range to connect, she threw less than 200 strikes while working the entire time. So what Holloway's doing, actually being in distance to land strikes at all times and throwing a strike every two seconds, is even more unbelievable when you consider that. Now, in terms of this fight, I, um, you know, I was live tweeting, which was a rarity, but it was on at a decent time. And my experience live tweeting it was, uh, you know, in, in round one, I was like, oh, they, you know, they've, they've worked out that he, he goes to the long guard or he covers up a lot. Um, and the more I thought about that as the fight progressed, I was like, oh, yeah, probably should have seen a little bit of this coming. Because, you know, I was, I was thinking, katie has got decent footwork. He's got a nice jab. He's got a powerful right hand and he's good on the counter. You know, a lot of things that could, could shake Max's confidence and stop him from applying that incredible uh, work rate. And then... Max Holloway came out and basically the plan seemed to be get him on the back foot early, keep him on the back foot and just throw as much as possible. And mad credit to Calvin Cater. You know, I can just say that before I say anything else, except, you know, I have sucked Max's dick for a little while already now. But before we go on, Calvin Cater, astonishingly tough man. And, you know, he took an incredible pounding, not just to the head, but to the body as well. You know, I watched him fight um, Zabit and he tired Zabit out by letting Zabit punch his body, which is just... Um, not not textbook boxing, but he is, you know, he was already pretty remarkable for his toughness. And then he took the worst ass kicking in UFC history and was still sort of smiling and being like, ah, well, shit <laughs> afterwards. Um, but yes, the, one of the habits that he has is that he will put on the high, the really high guard or go to the long guard, which is one arm outstretched, other arm either up 
in a guard or across the face in like a folding guard. But the the long guard is a, uh, a Muay Thai technique. Yeah, you know, you see variations of it used in boxing. Roy Jones used to like to... Uh, well, in, in boxing, it's more like a leverage guard where you're putting it over the opponent's arm or you're framing off them. Um, Roy Jones used to use that a lot. He, he believed that was mu- much more useful than putting your guard up towards your face. Um, Vladimir Klitschko too. Lots of people do it, but Holloway tends to go. Sorry, um, Cater tends to go to that like one, two shapes really, you know, and and then sort of slowly circle his way out. And as soon as Max started getting on top of him, the footwork sort of disappeared, and he was covering up more and more. And then the more that he was put under pressure, and the more that Max hit his body and head, the less the feet came into play, and the more he was just covering up. And there was a few things, that, you know. Again, the article is quite big. Go read the article; you'll enjoy it. And it has, um, you know, stills to demonstrate what I'm talking about here. But there are a few things that I really like from Max in this one. And I, I praised him a lot for being an adaptable fighter. I gave him game plan of the year because he came out and fought a completely different fight against Volkanovski the second time around. But in that first round, he came out and he tried to jab Cater in the face. And Cater immediately low kicked him and caught him in that bad position. You know, when his foot's in the middle and his, his legs being kicked across himself. And I went, oh, that's not good. And then he did it a second time, and then Max just got in his face so much that he, you know, he never really went back to it much. Uh, he landed one like in the third round, but basically it became a non-factor after him trying to apply it in the first round. Uh, and one of the ways that Holloway did that was by using uh, a slappy left hook, which I really liked. You know, His jab is going to steal a lot of the attention for this fight because he was scoring it so much. But in that very early going, a lot of his, his, his uh, leads, his setups, started with a, a slapping left hook. And the left hook, often he threw it open hand. But it didn't seem like his intention was to land because, you know, you, you're not going to catch a, a fast box. You know, you saw Cater was pulling his head away from jabs and Max has a really good jab. Uh, you're not going to catch a, a very fast box with that slappy left hook. But if he's going to go to the cover up, you're saying, I'm not going for the, the punch. This punch is way less likely to hit him in the head. But in taking the obvious block, he's got his hand pinned to his head and I can shoot inside that. You know, I can step in close and not worry as much about the counter right hand because a lot, you know, one of counters, uh, one of Cater's best counters is that right hand across the top of the jab and he actually, you know, he rattled Max a couple of times with that. There were a couple of occasions where Max got caught over the top of the jab and he took a step back and was like, uh-oh. And I went, oh dear, are we are we getting sort of a poorier situation here again? And he immediately got back on it and, and obviously dominated the fight. But, um... That right hand was a real problem. And one of the ways that he took it away was by going, you know, slappy left hook to the head, right straight to the body, slappy left hook to the head, right straight down the middle. And then sometimes he was going left hook and then jabbing off the hook, which is just, people don't like it when I do the the finger kiss French chef style, but imagine I'm doing that. Um, The other upside of the slappy left hook was that he's stepping out to his left a bit when he does it. You can go and watch like the first round. Well, I mean, he does it all through the fight. He really went back to it in the fifth round, but... He steps out on a slight angle as he throws the left hook to line up the right straight, which is you know, a favourite of Mark Hunt. But in doing so, he, he, he moves into the arc of that kick and, and muffles it a bit, as opposed to stepping straight in the centre and be like, I'm in a blade of stance, kick my leg. Um, so that was pretty cool. And then Max was um, really... The secret to the success of the fight was to, to get uh, Kata covering up and keep him covering up. And part of that was in throwing lots and lots of combinations. You know, you don't... Holloway will swarm with like eight, ten punches or whatever, but most of his work is in twos, threes, occasional fours. Um, and, and most good boxers work in twos and threes because you're a lot safer working in twos and threes. You're not opening yourself up and just sort of hoping the guy's there. You can predict a little bit more or, or rather you can um, you can keep your, you can you know your openings when you're throwing twos and threes. Those are the things you practice in the gym. And one of the ways that Holloway kept up that amazing torrent of, uh, of offense was to jab in between. You know, he'd throw like a a, a three two or a or a three one or something like that, and then he'd jab in and, and start again. Um, and I think that really like summed up the difference between their jabs. Like uh, Cater's jab is like a standalone weapon, and I, I he probably does jab a lot harder than Holloway. You know, he's got the kind of like BJ Penn jab where it's just in your face, hammering your nose in, and um, Holloway's jab does a lot of things. It gets him in close. It hides his setups for back kicks and things. And most importantly, it joins his combinations together. And then the other side of that, aside from like keeping Cater on the back foot, was to occasionally let him come off the back foot and punish him for it. You know, you, there were a lot of instances where Max would either flick the jab in his face and not hit him, you know, not quite be close enough, or um, show him a shoulder feint. And Cater would throw back with the kind of right hand that clearly he wanted to end the fight if he landed his counter. And he'd swing and Max would 
pull his head back or just get on you know use the jab and dip occasionally but he'd just not be there and Cater would throw himself completely out of position and Max would immediately be back in with just another little probing jab and then a right hand behind it and then another jab or two and a right hand and a left hook and it basically every time Cater opened up he regretted it more than if he'd stayed in guard just eating blows on his on his forearms and the odd body shot and things um so he, he really made it he made it an environment where Cater didn't want to open up. And, and, you know, one of the things that I've always praised about Max Holloway, I've always said that he's one of the craftiest strikers in MMA. And what he does so well is just, uh, you know, he recognizes what the opponent's doing and he he, beha- he reacts accordingly or, or strikes accordingly. Like an example would be he, he landed probably four or five back kicks in this fight or attempted five back kicks in this fight. He landed one by showing a jab, level changing to show a body jab and stepping across as he did so and then back kicking you know the classic step across and back kick he landed another immediately afterwards on the counter jumping pivoting into the back kick as the opponent comes in and then he landed one as cater was circling on the cage so those are the the, the three ideal situations for landing the back kick uh and he he demonstrated all three of them probably within like a round of each other you know, probably five minutes he did that and uh you know, that just sums up the the level this guy's working on from a technical standpoint. Like, I'm not talking about technical as in, like, his mechanics are so good. I'm talking about he's thinking and he's setting things up and he's reacting to what his opponent is showing him. Uh, you know, one of the other things that I really like about his incredible um, pace and, and keeping the other guy on, on defense all the time is that he has time to decide. Like, you know, he has he can see what the other guy's doing. The other guy's got his, his gloves up and going, oh, fuck. You know, it's a lot harder to see when you're shelling up. But there are numerous nice examples of like Max ad- adapting to how Cater was covering up, how he was moving, where he was. Uh, like the the spearing right knee that he kept landing, he'd throw like a, a left hook and then come in with a right knee to the body or a right hand and then leap in with the right knee to the body, which works really well. Especially the guy goes like crazy monkey style, answer the telephone, get the elbow up really high to block the right hand. Um, beneath Benil Dariush did that to Bob Bozer, I think it was. But yeah, that, that little right knee that you saw all throughout that fight. Obviously, he, he hits the body wonderfully, like not, and he, he hits the body appropriately too. He's not just looking for like leaping left hooks to the body like a young Takanori Gomi. Out in the open, he's using straight right hands, and, and if he's southpaw, straight left hands. Didn't really go southpaw this fight very much, but straight right hands to the body, straight into the solar plexus, because that's the long one. That's what you're going to get when you're out in the open, and you're both moving around. When he's near the fence, he'll faint the jab and come in and, and hook to the body and throw um, like shoeshine flurries. And it was really interesting because Kata obviously, like I said, has an iron body, but Max had dug in like three or four huge shots to the body. And then he showed him a jab and he just flicked off like a little, it wasn't even a, a full left hook to the body, but hooking off the jab. And it was clearly the one that Kata wasn't expecting because that started that just descent, that downward spiral in the fourth round. That was when he went to the cage and he was winded and Holloway just teed off on him. Uh, that fourth round, Holloway landed 150 strikes and threw 200. Uh, so he's working at like a 70% connection rate, which obviously you don't have access to the stats during the fight, but you can watch that and go, yeah, this guy is is not throwing anything and he's getting hit a lot. Uh, and I think that was where it got really hard to side with his corner, you know, not stopping the fight. I mean, obviously, I don't want to say I don't know Calvin Cater personally. Um, I'm not personally invested in his career and and his health even, but... Um, Certainly Herb Dean should have been looking at, at that a bit closer. Certainly the second time I watched it, I was I was much more uncomfortable watching it. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's the thing. A good, a good fight is like a really good wank. The, the better it is, the more guilty you feel after it. Um, other nice things that Max Holloway was doing. Oh, oh, you know, folding elbows when he got uh, catered to the fence. He, he put both hands on and, and folded the elbows over. Uh, waiting when he threw that huge flurry and he could see Cater was trying to come back with elbows. And he just show him something, let Cater swing off the fence a couple of times, and then Cater's worse off for having swung and taken himself out of position and used up basically his heart and soul trying to score the knockout in that instant. And then there was that nice um, sort of side kick that Holloway was using. He was using a right side kick from Orthodox to kick the lead leg, which is interesting because he's always liked the low line side kick. He, you know, Conor McGregor did it to him eight years ago. How, How crazy is it that it's eight years since that fight? And people are still talking about it, like, well, we saw it all in the first fight. <laughs> like, come on. Um, especially when you consider, like, the third round of that fight was Conor McGregor, not a notable takedown artist, taking down Max Holloway, who now is almost impossible to take down and almost impossible to keep down. I think there's a lot of um, 
interesting folds to that rematch. But yes, he was using this this sidekick with his right leg, and it was interesting because he he used it to get on to Southpaw instead of from Southpaw, uh, and then he didn't look like he wanted to be in Southpaw for this fight. He was like, ah, oh, no, actually, I'll, I'll change it back. <laughs> didn't uh, very little notable work from Southpaw in this one. But honestly, like I, I tweeted and then deleted in the week. You know, Max is already in my all time great list. I think he's he's already one of the savviest fighters in MMA as a striker, and I think he's certainly accomplished enough that you could be putting him in an all-time great list you know maybe not like number one which is the one that people always get upset about but certainly he is among the pantheon of greats in mma and i think he probably will be for a long long time um and you know this like he he just sort of left the title picture even though it was very um you know it's very typical of mma or what i would expect of mma for max holloway to lose the controversial decision in that rematch for the title, and then suddenly get knocked out in this one. Yeah, that's the way that MMA seems to work. But he didn't look like he'd missed a beat, did he? Now, again, I do want to say that, like, there, I, I think Cater's style really did play into this. The more I, like, in that first round, I went, oh, yeah, he does cover up a lot. You know, that's a lot of his answers. And that's going to play into someone who just wants to get the volume going. Um, but still, such a dangerous fighter, and Holloway just made him look chumpish, almost. What's next for Holloway? I presume another title shot because uh, they've just booked Volkanovski versus Ortega, which is one of the stranger ones because it doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, Ortega took like two years off. He looked good against Korean Zombie, but consider that they announced Ngani versus Stipe too at the same time. Think how hard Stipe had to work, sorry, uh, Ngani had to work for a second title shot. And then uh, Ortega just gets one off beating sort of a mid top 10 guy. But yeah, I, I presume Max is... Um, Actually, it'd be really... Oh, no, they've already booked it. I was going to say it'd be really nice if they did a title eliminator between Max and uh, Ortega. They could do the... They could do the Zabit fight because, obviously, Zabit... I mean, Zabit seems to want to wait for um, Yair and continue complaining, like, whenever the fight falls through. At a certain point, you know, you've got to go, yeah, no, this guy's not going to make it to the fight. Let's just move on with our lives. But uh, that could be a fun fight, too. I was, I was joking, like, can you imagine the strike differential on a Zabit uh, Holloway third round because the beat just stops working in the third round um yeah if it was a beat i mean not even joking you want that fight on a on a big pay-per-view where there's a title fight so that you're guaranteed it's only three rounds and you're wanting to wrestle but obviously on commentary there was a lot of um you know this is a new max holloway blah 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 but um i think the things with max holloway is, is that like when you see him on a good on on a not a good day but like when his stuff works it is uh it, you know he's talking about like covid it's exponential uh spread but it it gets worse and worse and worse and like the if he if he can take an inch he will take a mile and look amazing doing it you know he doesn't tend to scrape wins um but the people who've like given him a lot of trouble are the ones who can one shape you know worry him about his chin because you know he's got one of the best chins in the sport by statistics i think he's got most absorbed without being dropped or something like that but you could see like against Poirier, when he took some of those big bombs, he really took a step back and was like, oh, you know, he looked very concerned where he really thrives when he has the confidence to stay in there and keep throwing uh, and, and just force the guy onto the back foot. But again, you know, he, he fought his way back into that fight in the in later rounds and some people thought he'd won it. Um, but the Conor McGregor fight is another example where like not even the power, but the pressure, he put Max Holloway on the back foot and he, he annoyed him so much with that uh, low line sidekick. You know, if you've not seen that fight in a while, go and watch how much that sidekick pisses Max Holloway off. I'm not even talking like, you know, he's not worried about his knee being broken, but every time you plant your foot on someone's knee, you throw their hips back <laughs> and out of position. Uh, and, and it just, it fucks up your boxing stance. And then you had Volkanovski who, who cut him off with low kicks and then, uh, you know, clinched with him a lot in the second fight. Um, so it basically is ways to stop the activity of, of Holloway. You know, you either have to make him second guess himself, like uh, Matt Brown versus um, Robbie Lawler is the example I always use, or you have to tie him up or kick his, you know, the, the leg kick served the purpose of cutting off his combinations and lowering his activity. But I mean, that's 20 minutes raving about that fight. Um, if you do, <laughs> go read the article because I wax lyrical there too and there's lots of examples. But I, I just, you know, 
you don't get to see a lot like that. And, and honestly, I was a little bit uncomfortable the second time through, just being like, you know, this guy's not going to get back into it. But at the time, I was thinking like, wow, we're only one good K to shot away. And for the most part, Holloway was well aware of that and being like, yes, please throw that shot. Oh, I'm not there. <laughs> Coming back with a combination while he's off position. Um, but what else was good on this card? I mean, Carlos Connick versus Matt Brown kind of played out like you would expect that fight to at this stage in their careers. Um, there was some cool stuff in there, like Holloway hitting that switch, the, the same switch he used against GSP, but this is a guy who's not very good at wrestling gen- generally, uh, or certainly take down defense. And he, he was using a beautiful like stand up to hit the switch. And um, then he, you, you noticed he was doing a lot of holding the foot from the turtle uh, and, and just using that to ride and keep Brown down. His striking looked as goofy as ever, um, <laughs> but uh, it was serving a purpose. Matt Brown hit that lovely Sasai Komiashi, his little sweep. I mean, you know, it's not called that if it's Thai boxing, but basically you pull the, fight, the opponent forward. As they step, you block their um, foot from stepping. And then Carlos Condit hit an absolutely gorgeous, um, I suppose, a wedge throw. You know, that's what they call it. it was, that's what you'd call it in like karate when um, Machida or someone does that, you know, where you shoot your right. They, they did it inside punches. They just slip inside the jab or whatever and push their arm through and, and step around the legs. Um, but he did it off like a fake kick. It was just gorgeous. I mean, there's gifts of it everywhere. Go watch it. Um, but yeah, the, the rest of this, basically the co, the main was the only fight that really delivered. The co-main was welcomed because basically everything was either a tedious slog in the in the prelims or uh, a really fast knockout on the main. Um, some proper strange ones here too, like Joaquin Buckley. We looked at Alessio de, de Chirico and I, I honestly, I disrespected him because I thought, you know, I looked at his record and I was like, this guy seems like he's being set up here um, to make Buckley look good. And again, you just can't think like that at this level. He backed around, he circled around the ring. Buckley had a hard time closing like he did against Kevin Holland. And um, Chirico just kept pounding his, his body and, and legs with kicks and then went high and knocked him out. Not an awful lot to break down there, I'm afraid. And then the uh, Lee, the leech, Sorry, he's listed as Jing Liang Li. I thought Jing Liang was his family name, but I was obviously wrong. Li, that makes it a lot easier, so I just called him Li. Uh, but Li knocked out Santiago Pons- Ponzinibbio. God, that's so strange and also kind of heartbreaking because Ponzinibbio was on top form when he left. Like, he had made Magni look awful. <laughs> and uh, then he comes back, he gets a bone infection or something insane, comes back and just gets sparked by... Um, Jing Liang Li. But Li's interesting because he didn't really, like, he wasn't really a big hitter back in the day. You know, he's been in the UFC for a long time. Decisions, the odd guillotine choke or something like that. But in recent years, I, you know, he's been backing people up with punches and, and really putting on the pressure. And I, maybe that's why they call him the leech, the draining thing. But I, I've just been so impressed with, like, the, um, the Zach Otto knockout and the Zawada fight where he just put him under pressure the whole time, boxed him up. And then hit him with a sidekick as a bonus to knock him out. Um, and then Zaleski, obviously, you know, I was so hype on Zaleski and, and uh, Lee made him look very bad. But now we've got this weird situation where Lee has literally just lost to Neil Magny. <laughs> so basically everything that Santiago Ponzinibbio did before his layoff is null and void now. Uh, real shame. But, you know, you get caught leaning back with your head up in the air and you get left hooked by a guy who's marching with his punches. Um, not really a lot you can do about it. I mean, honestly, like, it was a knockout. It didn't look like a that bad a knockout. You know, he wasn't like stiff as a board and laying there with his eyes rolled or whatever um, for ages. I, I would say I, I want him to get back in action as soon as possible because you like you you can't just rest on your haunches after that sort of loss, um, after that sort of layoff, especially. But cool, give Lee someone. In, I was going to say Lee someone like Vicente Luke, but I think Vicente Luke just picked up a good win, didn't he? I can't recall. Um, and the one that I told everyone to to look out for was probably the only one that I, I basically, what I said on the podcast happened. I was like, Dusko Todorovic is very, very sh- sharp and fast, whereas Sor- Soriano gets by on being like the southpaw and swatting in sideways with that left hand. And Todorovic will probably hit him and then Soriano will hit him in the aftermath. You know, get his head jacked back and throw the, the left hand by instinct and, and catch him. And he did it about four times. Like Todorovic, Todorovic kept hitting him clean and then getting hit on the return. And they had an absolutely bizarre bit where he was basically waiting to be knocked out and his mouthpiece fell out and got stuck between the cage and the mat, which just like never happened before. But 
you know, that's the sort of thing like Muhammad Ali with the torn glove, where they're going to change the rules so that you have to, you definitely have to have a second mouthpiece there. Um, but that and like the Jake Ellenberger getting his foot stuck against Jorge Masvidal are the two that people are going to be the two now that people bring up about the rope, the the ring being better than the cage. You know, you, you bring up all these awful examples because every fight in the ring the ring gets in the way somehow. You know, dudes just get caught up in it all the time. And then people will go, ah, but remember, Jake Ellenberger got his toe caught in that one fight one time. And if we're going freak injuries, you know, like Ian McCall got a rope burn on his face that took half his face off and and left him with a huge cut in the opening seconds of his... Was that his rising debut? That dude was absolutely cursed in in the latter days of his career. So that's basically everything that happened on the card that mattered. Um... We lost out on a Betch Cohea retirement fight, which, you know, the, the retirement's more important than the fight in that case. But yeah, that's about it. So really, like, the, the upcoming um, McGregor Poirier card, we're going to be talking about on Thursday, probably. Uh, and I'll devote a whole podcast to it and get it in the arts so that everyone comes in and sees it. Um, but we've got this weird midweek card going on, and I'm not quite sure what to make of it. I like a midweek card, it just makes it a little bit hard to cover because all your timings are set up around fights being on Saturdays and the rare Friday event. Um, but it's an odd one because you've got Michael, you got the main event is Michael Chiesa versus uh, Neil Magny, which is a, a good fight in terms of a matchup. Not sure how much sense it makes like in the context of the division on account of Neil Magny being on a three-run winning streak against good welterweights, Li Zhang, uh, Zhingliang, Anthony Rocco Martin and Robbie Lawler. While Michael Chiesa has basically fought um, sort of the old men crew, Carlos Condit, who, uh, in fairness, he finished and Magni couldn't. But Diego Sanchez, you know, I'm not really at all interested in people beating Diego Sanchez at this point. And then Rafael dos Anjos. And again, if you're, a, if you're a wrestler and you're a welterweight and Rafael dos Anjos agrees to fight you because he'll agree to fight anyone, even really obvious, terrible style matchups, um, you know... You can see the difference there. However, you know, I think stylistically between them, there's a really interesting matchup. I'm just saying that they should be at different points in their title run, um, but they don't seem to be. You'd have to give Magda the edge on the feet. Um, you know, Chiesa, in fairness, landed some good shots against Kevin Lee and against Jorge Masvidal. The Masvidal one was especially interesting because Masvidal was having a lot of trouble with his length. And I think he was fighting Southpaw in that... He might be a Southpaw. I can't remember if he's a full-time Southpaw. But he was fighting Southpaw for bits of that fight. And uh, Jorge Masvidal does not typically like fighting Southpaws or certainly has a lot of trouble with the left straight. But Chiesa, you know, he's a smothering um, top player. Gets on, get, Gets you down, gets on top of you just mauls you to a submission normally. Uh, Magni more about, uh, certainly more active with his ground and pound, much more active on the feet. His, his striking's become a lot more reliable in recent years. He used to just be wrestling with an awkward jab, but, you know, you saw how good Li Jing, Jingliang is on the feet now, and uh, Magni had no trouble with him. So I don't know what to make of this fight. It's one of those ones that I put down as, like, interesting, but I don't have a lot to say about it. And then you've got the weird rest of the card which you know co-main event Wally Alves which just you're like you're looking at that and going that shouldn't happen but then you realize oh no someone dropped out against Munir uh, Lazez so Wally Alves has stepped in Ike Villanueva versus Vinicius Moreira Vinicius Moreira is garbage <laughs> and this guy's ranked 20 below him on topology so yeah not looking forward to that fight too much Roxanne Modafferi has taken on Vivian Araju both of those fighters bleh, hit and miss uh, Tyson Nam's fighting Matt Schnell. Good to see Tyson Nam fighting someone who isn't coming in on the last minute and, and clearly in the wrong weight class because that's how he scored that amazing knockout recently. Um, Leroy Murphy is quite interesting. Undefeated uh, Brit coming in against Douglas Dondrage, who's most notable for looking like the uh, deprived class in Dark Souls. Um, absolutely shredded when he's fighting a bantamweight. But then the last thing he did was in uh, November 2019, he beat Henan Brow. Um, and, you know, that's... Yeah. He had a fight before that against Petty Yan, we got stopped in the second. Obviously, Petty Yan was ascendant at that time. And a win over Marlon Vera before that. But again, he's fought like three times since 2018. You've got Amari Akhmadov and Tom Breeze, which I believe has been moved to this card. Or has that been cancelled now? Fuck, I can never remember. But that's an interesting one. In the, I said it last time, but... 
in the sense that both of them are interesting fighters, not the most exciting fighters in the world. Um, Omari Akhmadov keeps winning, but then gets in with Chris Weidman and looks ho-hum against a guy who's basically there to be a name at this point. Um, and then Tom Breeze, a really interesting character because he was an undefeated prospect. People were very hype on him. I wrote a piece. Uh, I think the title they chose is like, uh, is Tom Breeze the UK's next champion or, or something? Um, but, you know, I, I was quite hot on him. He suffered a couple of losses and had a long layoff, but he's still um, a very promising all-around fighter. Yeah, last loss was to Brendan Allen back in February. But this dude, from 2018 to 2019, it was just constant cancellations due to injuries or opponent injuries. He got one back in the win column by um, jabbing the face off uh, KB Buller back in October, but I honestly don't remember it. Um, but again, like that, that is a fight that could have some cool technical moments. It could have a cool finish, but... Uh, I would not bite your hand off if you offered me that fight, to be honest. And then Ricky Simone's fighting some last-minute replacement. Um, Sue Madurji is is about... He's okay. He's fighting a 3-2 and two opponent. You know, it, we're, we're doing... Fucking Marcus Perez is on here. Um, we, you know what we're doing? We're doing those, like, whoever we can get cards. It's the most whoever we can get cards. Because, you know, you saw the, the prelims last weekend. I mean, this is a whole card of that shit. Um... But then the other interesting pair of debuts is that you've got Francisco uh, Figueredo, who is apparently Deverson Figueredo's brother. Didn't know he had a uh, brother. Apparently he's from Team Figueredo. Didn't know they had a team. But he's been fighting in Jungle Fight up till um, recently. When's the, when's his last, oh man, last time he fought was uh, September 2019, so he's had a long old layoff. His brother has probably pulled some strings to get him in here there. Umar Nurmagomedov has apparently been waiting to debut forever. I can't remember if it's um, injuries or visa issues that's kept him from coming in. Uh, and then the interesting one for me personally is Mason Jones, because he's always been really compelling on the Cage Warriors cards. I think he was a two-division champion in Cage Warriors. He was really good on their last one, uh, or the last one. Uh, they, they did like three events back-to-back. -back. Uh, when was that? Fuck, was that September? Yeah, he won the Cage Warriors lightweight and welterweight titles, which... Again, like Conor McGregor, you know, people will draw that comparison, but again, like Conor McGregor, Cage Warriors titles, a lot of the time they're vacant because it's, it's become sort of a feeder league. You know, it used to be that guys shopped their talents around these smaller leagues and you wouldn't be able to get them to defend a title and they'd get stripped and then there would be a fight for a vacant title. Um, or people go into the UFC and then you've still got a vacant title. So, you know, he won the uh, lightweight title in March of 2020, which was vacant, and then he won the welterweight title in September of 2020 with no fights in between, which again was vacant. So, you know, it, it's like double champ. It doesn't, you know, it means whatever it, it means whatever you read into it because a lot of them, it's just sort of like you took two fights and won them back to back. It's not like you've run through two divisions. But he is a lot of fun. He's got a great left hook and he's uh, not scared to give up weight. So what's this one at? Is this at welterweight or lightweight? Because I thought he looked a little small at, light, uh, at welterweight, but you know, it's at lightweight apparently. So yeah, cool. Some stuff to, to look forward to there. Oh, and he's fighting Mike Davies who beat the shit out of Thomas Gifford. So you're going to get a banger there, hopefully. Hopefully they're just going to swing at each other's heads. But uh, that's about all I can tell you about that card. I'm not, I've not looked into it a great deal. I've not like done the maths in my head and looked at the matchups. There just isn't an awful lot there. I'm just hoping for some good fights. Um, not really caring about the matchups. But I think I'll cut it off there for today, just to get this up in time. Um, and we'll be back on Thursday to talk about the upcoming pay-per-view, which uh, has some good stuff on, uh, most notably a rematch between Dustin Poirier and Conor McGregor. If you want to read the Max Holloway versus Calvin Cater awestruck post-fight breakdown, uh, sign up to the Patreon, support the podcast, get all the history episodes and extra articles we do. If you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. I'm your boy Jack Slack. Max Holloway's diesel pumping heart. Bless.